Hi, my name is Claire Siepser. My pronouns are they, them, or she, her. I'm a graduate student in the Counseling and Human Services Department at Lehigh University, as well as a member of the Resistance Lab, which is headed by Dr. Nicole Johnson and has the goal of ending gender-based violence. I will be presenting today on Title IX, giving a brief overview at of contextual factors and histories surrounding the law. The reason I'm doing this is because even though I study in the field of gender-based violence, I kept finding myself confused about exactly what Title IX is and how it works. So I went and did a bunch of research and helped write a paper. Um, and one of the things I learned is that it's not just me. It's a confusing law. I figured out that there are historical and current reasons why the law is so hard to understand and implement. So I made this video to hopefully help you understand the law a bit better as well. So the structure of this presentation will be, I'll talk about the context and background, then define Title IX. Then I'll talk a little bit about the history since its implementation, followed by the current situation, and finally, thoughts about the future. So starting with the context and background, I'll give you the actual law right here. So it is that no person in the U.S. shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in or denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal aid. At first, it seems simple, but I'm going to present the context and break down why this law is so complex. I think if you look, you can see that there's two parts that might be um, defined differently depending on who you are and what your goals are. So on the basis of sex and subjected to discrimination. But I'll come back to that a little bit when I talk about the definition of the law itself. Something also to note is that this law was passed in 1972, which is almost 50 years ago, and so many things have changed. So before we go into the details anymore right now, I'll talk about the context. So what is it that brought about Title IX? It's actually officially named the Patsy Mink Equal Opportunity in Education Act. It was renamed after Patsy Mink, who is one of the co-sponsors of the bill and did significant work to create equity and justice. Something that brought this about is that the 60s and 70s were a time of huge movements in social justice. So the quote, I think, gives a good picture of what things were like. Women just did not have that many opportunities. They were given specific realms for education, specific realms for hobbies or interests, specific realms for for even within a profession such as education, you could be a teacher, but not a principal. And in health, you could be a nurse, but not a doctor. Within the actual educational field, they were almost never given tenure and or appointed college president. And if a student got pregnant, the education ended. And further, graduate and professional schools openly discriminated against women. So this is a graph made by Hand and Clean in 2007 on the impact of Title IX for women in college. You'll see on the left-hand side, it's undergraduate education. And on the right-hand side, it is graduate education. You can really see the huge jumps especially in science, medicine, and law. For graduate school, it is now almost equal numbers of field, women in the fields in this chart. This has a huge impact on medicine and law, especially since now women's issues in both of those fields are now being considered by women. This has drastically changed the field of medicine and law for women. It is also of note since Title IX itself is a law, so having women and people with minority gender identities now have a say in what those laws look like. For the history, at first a Democrat from Oregon named Edith Green attempted to incorporate women's rights into the pre-existing Civil Rights Act as an amendment. And I would like to make a little note here that I'm using the term women's rights and talking about women as cis women primarily because that's really what this was about at the time. So as you can see here, the Civil Rights Act only protected people on the basis of race, color, or national origin at this time. It was a lot of a goal to try to include women's rights and sex discrimination into this because it would have meant that all programs that receive federal assistance, not just education, would have had to create equity for women. Unfortunately, this did not pass. And at that time, it was suggested that rather than trying to tackle all of the programs, they would just focus on education. And that's what led to the development of Title IX over the next two years. So the people involved in this were Patsy Mink, Edith Louise Starrett Green, and Birch Bay. So Patsy Mink and Birch Bay were the co-sponsors of the bill 
And Edith Louise Sterrett Green was someone who worked tirelessly for equity and education and women's rights. And she's the one who originally proposed the previous amendment to the Civil Rights Act. All three of these politicians worked tirelessly. I do want to spend a second talking about Patsy Mink because she was amazing. She was elected to the House of Representatives in 1964 and was the first woman of color and the first Asian American in the House of Representatives. And she served 12 terms. And being the first of anyone, there's a lot of scrutiny. So the fact that she was able to help pass this bill is huge. And Title IX itself, there's a reason it's called Title IX and not Title I or Two or Three. It's because it was a part of a long bill. So I made this infographic to really give you some context for what that means. So this is a, an image of what the entire, all of the pages of the bill. It was 147 pages and Title IX was on the 138th page. So that's the green one. And even on that page, it was a very small portion. It was this small little yellow part in this on this one page. So although there was a bitter fight in Senate in some ways, in other ways, it was hardly even noticed. Nixon gave a long speech as he wrote this bill into law. And the speech was about desegregation and busing, and there were no comments about sex or gender. So something that's interesting to note, because many people know Title IX as it relates to sport, is that it actually wasn't even mentioned. The impact of it on athletics became apparent almost immediately, but that wasn't even mentioned in the discussion of it. So what is Title IX, the Patsy Mink Equal Opportunity in Education Act? So here it is again, and as I mentioned before, you should note on the basis of sex and subjected to discrimination. So it seems simple, but what does that mean in practice? The implications of applications are ever-changing because they're influenced by a lot of people and systems. And over time, these systems have changed in societies and further definitions and public opinion has changed. So I kind of went through and determine what the main influences have been on this law. So there's been the legal influences, this office called the Office of Civil Rights, public perception, politics, and changing terms and definitions. So what are they and how have they affected Title IX? First is a legal influence. So something that you potentially know about is legal precedent. So what legal precedence is, is when there is a court case and a decision is made, future court cases will look back on that decision to determine what they should do. So if a case comes to court about Title IX and a decision is made, future lawyers will look at that decision to determine what to do. So that actually really affects Title IX and how it is interpreted. There's two timelines I've included here about the precedent, legal precedent setting law cases and the defining laws. There's one here for athletics and then one here for sexual assault. The second influence you should know about is the Office of Civil Rights. So this is part of the Department of Education, which is an office that that enforces several federal civil rights laws, including Title IX. And this office is determined by the head of the Department of Education, who is appointed by the president. So that is something to keep in mind because that changes with each administration. So what that office does, it puts out guidelines about what does on the basis of sex mean, what does discrimination mean, and when people have questions or unsure, they are to create guidance of how to implement these laws. They have done a couple things especially, which are right out right what are known as Dear Colleague Letters, to give these guidance to the educational institutions. Another major influence is public perception. So media plays a huge role in shaping the public perception of reality and politics, and there is this cycle of public perception affecting policy. And in addition to that, there's politics itself. So whoever is in office appoints the Secretary of Education, who then is in charge of the Department of Education, and runs the Office of Civil Rights, and they put out the guidance about Title IX. And a little bit later in the presentation, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that because there's been some recent major changes. And uh, finally, a big influence is also changing definition and society. Um, So the term sexual harassment did not even exist when Title IX 
was enacted into law. It doesn't mean it wasn't happening. It's just there wasn't a name for it. And there was much more cultural acceptance of harassment. Additionally, non-binary and transgender recognitions have increased over time. And the idea of gender itself and what equity is and what women's rights are has additionally changed. Furthermore, ideas of what is considered acceptable or safe is and that what is unacceptable has also changed. And our ideas of masculinity and femininity and what sex means and what gender means, these have changed in the past 50 years significantly, and thus it has affected Title IX. So since Title IX was signed into law, there has been a history. And this isn't a linear timeline. This isn't something that was just like one thing and then the next. It all inter was interwoven, but there were really key aspects of the focus of Title IX. And that has kind of created a timeline of what Title IX has been focused on. So originally, it was really focused on athletics. And that's why a lot of more people know about Title IX in terms of athletics. Um, and then it moved on to sexual harassment, then rights of pregnant and parenting students, and then lesbian and gay students. And then finally, in the past 10 years, transgender and non-binary student rights have really come to the forefront. So... None of these happened in a vacuum. None of them happened at once. We're still dealing with the issues of Title IX and athletics um, and sexual harassment. And it's not this clear timeline, but I think this is how it has been seen in the public eye and for media attention. So I'll talk about each of those aspects. So for athletics, this kind of tells you exactly what it means and meant for athletics. And a lot of it has to do with finances and resources, especially in terms of what, what does it mean when you say that athletic programs should be accommodated? And this is what it means. Things like equitable coaching and locker rooms and practice facilities and training facilities and publicity and recruitment are all big aspects of this. So sexual harassment is really important because it wasn't, didn't even, the idea didn't even exist until after Title IX was put into place. Um, and the guidance, there was significantly more guidance put out during the Obama administration that extended and increased the rights of students who have been sexually harassed. And then in the past few days, we've actually seen a change in those rights. And they've now been significantly reduced by the current administration and Betsy DeVos. Another group of students who this has greatly affected is pregnant and parenting students. So these are some of the rights of pregnant and parenting students. And a lot of them have to do with if this is something that is done for students, then it is also allowed to be done for you. And you should not be treated differently just because you are pregnant or parenting. And if it's something that they allow for students who need the accommodations, then for other reasons, then you should also be allowed. This is another list of those. It's things such as being able to reschedule, making up missed work, you can't be required to take time off and they cannot exclude you and they cannot make you attend and your medical records can't be treated any differently than any other student. Another group is transgender and non-binary students. So in 2014, it was this very exciting thing that happened, which is the Office of Civil Rights put out a document called Questions and Answers on Title IX and sexual violence that greatly expanded the protection for students. And one of the things it did is that it extended claims of discrimination based on gender identity. And something this did was clarified that sex discrimination included claims based on gender identity or failure to conform to stereotypical notions of masculinity or femininity. And this is huge because the idea of on the basis of sex could mean a lot of things. Does it mean sex assigned at birth or can it mean gender? Because gender identity wasn't even a discussion back in 1970. So the fact that they clarified that it, any discrimination based on gender identity significantly expands the rights of transgender and non-binary and gender minority students. And it actually also protects every student because the conforming to a stereotypical notion of masculinity or femininity is hard for anyone. If you are forced into these roles, there is no one who is the perfect exact ideal masculine or the perfect exact ideal feminine. Everyone is a mix of things and trying to conform to something like that is hard for anyone. So this allows you to express yourself however you want without fear of being bullied or harassed. However, 
recently this has changed and I will talk about that in a minute. So the current situation. So each school determines policies based on this guideline. So that's guidelines from the Office of Civil Rights, state laws, legal cases, their own culture and advisement from lawyers and administration. So they decide who handles the reports, who makes the reports, what offices to have on campus, what education or advocacy to have, and who is or is not a mandated reporter following the guidelines put out by the Office of Civil Rights. So I just want to go someplace else for a quick second. And for, in the case you don't have a Title IX coordinator, how would you actually report? So I wanted to go to the website really quickly. And you have to file this within 180 days. So no matter your trauma, no matter how you're feeling, it ha would have to be within 180 days, which might not be enough time. So here we are at the website. And this is how to file a complaint which is confusing because it's a government website and this is actually the instructions on how to do it. So first you're supposed to click on this and I'm not going to open it. Um, and then it talks about all these differences and then you move forward and it's like, oh, wait, where? And then it's here actually. So this is one option and there's other options, but you have to go through all this and read all this and imagine you have just experienced um, some sort of gender-based violence and have potential trauma, you're having to read all of this. And then here you can finally continue to the complaint form. And then it doesn't actually start here. You have to then, this seems again like maybe where it is, but it's not. And you scroll down and you can't get anywhere. It's actually over here. So you begin the assessment and then you finally get to the screen, which is a really complicated thing that you go through. Um, so imagine doing this while you are already having a hard time. I just wanted to point that out because I think it's important to understand what the actual experience of if you were having to report on your own. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what is happening now with the current administration and Title IX. So first, what happened in 2017 as a precursor to putting out new guidance is that the Office of Civil Rights under Betsy DeVos withdrew the 2011 Dear Colleague letter on sexual violence and those 2014 questions and answers that I was talking about earlier. And they, have pro and they started proposing a rules that narrowed a school's obligation to report and respond to cases of sexual misconduct. And I want to be very clear, that is all of the progress on sexual harassment and the rights of transgender and non-binary students new guidelines, significant public outcry. When they were published, it was tens of thousands of comments against this from experts in the field. And part of this is because the new guidelines are not consistent with the research and are the opposite of suggestions made by the experts in the field. Essentially, there it is significantly more rights for the person who is ac accused of sexual harassment, the accused perpetrator, not the survivor. Um, and these quotes are from the, the president of the 3,500 member association of Title IX administrators. So this is kind of the expert among experts who said this. And it's about 20 to 25% of the regulations are detrimental to the cause of gender equity in education. And really, it's all about to protecting you if you're excused, so, accused. So what some of the actual changes are now that colleges, and this is really, it's to protect the accused not survivors and the schools themselves. So now colleges can dismiss any complaint if it's not on a campus controlled building. So that means a campus party happening at a house like 10 feet from campus, if there is rape there, it is no longer under protection from Title IX. Cross-examination is now allowed as well, meaning the survivor could be questioned by the rapist family, or close friends. And number three, there is no longer a 60-day timeline. So schools can drag this out indefinitely in the case where they have done something that is questionable and don't want it to come to light. So number four is that if a perpetrator and a survivor go to separate schools, a case cannot be 
brought against the perpetrator just because they go to different schools, regardless of the fact that both schools would be under Title IX. Five is very distressing, which is that it's only a pattern and severe sexual harassment that will be investigated. So it now is no longer just one instance of sexual harassment. It has to be either significant, severe, or a pattern. So what happens with rape culture is that things escalate and they start as something and then get worse and worse. So we're now saying that it's not that first one. It has to be further up. Number six is mediation is now allowed, which is really complicated because the term mediation is one of those terms like life coach, where it can mean you have training, but it also may mean you don't have training. And also this can create re-traumatization if you are forced to be in the same room as your rapist. The school's obligation to act is reduced colleges. And one that's very distressing is that colleges are only required to act if a dean or a Title IX coordinator is informed directly, regardless of how safe those people are to talk with. So I'm going to go into that a little bit more, because this is a little more of a complicated one, because it has resolved that the issue of mandate of who is a mandatory reporter. So colleges get to determine that themselves, which could be really great if the college is responsible and understanding and understands the research on sexual assault and violence. However, if the university has a conservative view that does not align with the research on gender-based violence, they may do things that are severely detrimental. So potentially, there might be more people that a survivor can speak with without a report being made without their consent. However, with less mandatory reporters, instances of sexual assault may fall through the cracks or go unreported. And if the survivor doesn't feel comfortable talking to the dean or the Title IX coordinator for one reason or another, this may not ever be reported. Something I want to point out is that these are already so hard to understand, these laws and policies, just us right now. Even you had to watch this entire thing for me to explain them. But imagine if you're dealing with the actual trauma as a survivor and trying to understand this. It's just almost impossible. So what does this mean for the future? So something that Patsy Mink said at the 30th celebration about 20 years ago um, was that there has been a clear pattern of repeated attempts to weaken or undermine Title IX from the very beginning. For 30 years, and now 50, we have constantly needed to defend it or be on guard. So that's what we're seeing right now. So Title IX is being weakened and undermined. It is taking all of the progress we've made and going backwards. And it's extra distressing because the literature and media surrounding it makes it sound like it's actually to make it easier and more understandable and simpler. But gender-based violence isn't simple. And to go backwards and take out protections for people who are being harassed, people who have minority gender identities, is very distressing. So what can we do? So Something else that Patsy Mink said was, let's us rededicate ourselves to the goals of dignity, equality, and opportunity for all. And you can do that through things like educating yourself, educating others, watching videos like this, having other people watch this video, and advocating for Title IX and all of the important aspects of protecting people from gender-based violence, discrimination, and harassment. So thank you so much. If you have any questions, you can contact me or email the Resistance Lab. So the Resistance Lab website is wordpress.lehigh.edu backslash the resistance. And here you can find information and media and research we are doing and learn about what you can do to protect Title IX and, and gender-based violence and discrimination. Thank you so much for your time. Have a wonderful day. And if you have a minute, take some time to watch some of our other awesome videos that we put out to help educate through the transparency campaign or various media and research articles that we have presented. Thank you. And thank you in advance for helping protect Title IX now that you understand it.